Hello everyone, I'm Akhilesh Taniru. Uh, I'm doing my PhD at North Carolina State University. Uh, I work with Dr. Veena Mistra's group there. And today I'd be presenting about our work on highly sensitive ALDS and auto sensors and the thickness effect that we have seen uh, with gas sensing. Uh, I'll speak about how the objective came around, uh, the simple design concept that we had for it, uh, the fabrication and how it works, uh, and I'll end it with a future work in summary. So how did the objective come around? Uh, so our objective to start with was to make highly sensitive and low power sensors for environment monitoring. Uh, so we were looking at uh, the pollutants in the atmosphere and there were cases uh, which were reported of unpredictable asthma attacks and ozone was linked uh, for these uh, to the respiratory diseases like asthma, emphysema, and bronchitis. Uh, and But how does this uh, ozone create in the atmosphere? So when we have the pollutants like NO2 and VOCs, uh, which, are in one, uh, which are emitted uh, by the industries and also from the combustion engines, uh, when that is reacting with the UV light from the sun, then that would be creating the ozone. So wherever there are industries, wherever there are combustion engines, a lot of pollution, then you'll be having a lot of ozone. Uh, so unfortunately, places like Beijing or Delhi, which, which are reaching alarming levels of pollution, uh, there is a p higher chance of people uh, at risk in these places. So how much amount of ozone does it actually take to uh, get us in trouble? Not a lot, actually. So the EPA, uh, the Environmental Pro Protection Agency, suggests that around 75 ppb of ozone exposure for eight hours or more uh, would actually start giving us these problems. And that is not a lot of uh, ozone. That's a very little concentration. Uh, so what we need as a solution uh, are highly sensitive sensors which are portable and which, which can monitor the environment in real time and uh, continuously for long term. Uh, so that's the first uh, part of the objective. We need to make highly sensitive sensors. The second part, uh, we need low power sensors because uh, that would enable us to actually make the sensors portable and also help for continuous and long term monitoring uh, so the ozone could be tracked in the environment around us. The second part of the objective also came around uh, with the project that I'm working in. Stands for uh, ASIS stands for Advanced Self-Powered Systems of Integrated Sensors and Technologies. Uh, what we do at ASIS is we uh, harvest energy from the body heat and body motion and use this energy itself to power all these low power sensors and nano components. Uh, so that's the requirement. We are trying to uh, maximize the energy harvested from the body and minimize the energy consumed by the sensors. Uh, so my job in this assist is to make low power gas sensors for environment and breath monitoring. Uh, and that is the second part of the objective. So how do we how do we reach this objective? We were looking at all the different sorts of sensors which were available. Uh, metal oxide sensors seem to come close with the high sensitivity, fast response and recovery, low cost manufacturing, which is very important to make them uh, push that into the market. Uh, but the only barrier that they, we had there was uh, it was high temperature operational. So all the sensors typically uh, can operate at 400 C to 500 C temperature for, uh, to reach that low sensitivity. Uh, so that would require a lot of power. So how do we get rid of that barrier? So we had a solution for that, that is to deposit ultra thin sensing films, uh, which would then amplify the response. And I have a graphic here for you. So uh, with usually what we see with the MEM structures that we have is like a very thick sensing layer, and then the sensing layer would be heated and then you'll see the response with the, uh, with the analyte gas. But when you deposit a very thin film uh, in the thickness of the d length range, uh, then what would happen is uh, you'd have a space charge region of d length LD, uh, which is depleted of all the carriers, and thereby you'll see a sudden change in the resistance uh, whenever the analyte gas is coming in and depleting all the electrons from the thin layer. So you'll see an amplification of the response uh, when, whenever you have such a thin film. So how do you deposit this? Uh, we have a simple fabrication technique, atomic layer deposition, which is uniquely capable of uh, depositing such thin films. Uh, it's a self-limiting process. It could control the thickness to a precise nanometer range. Uh, and it's also in use in high quality CMOS manufacturing today. So what we have done is using ALD technique, we have deposited three different thicknesses, uh, 25, 50, and 100 cycles. When measured with an ellipsometer, it gave thicknesses of four nanometer, 6.5, and 12 nanometers. Uh, and then we went ahead and looked at the response. So now we have fabricated the sensor, uh, and uh, we are going to measure it. So the experimental setup to measurement was we use the Teledyne system, 
which is NIST certified and it can generate the gases at the low concentration that we want to test at in the PPB range. Uh, and then we have a directed gas flow into the testing chamber where we put the sensor and get it tested. So we deposited the sensor, fabricated it, and we saw these results. Uh, we see that at, with, uh, as we tone down the thickness, we see that the, constant, uh, the response of uh, the sensor increases. We see a very good signal to noise ratio. Uh, and what we used, what we see at the relevant concentration range of 75 ppb is that four nanometers, you see that the sensor is at least 50 times more responsive than the 6.5 and at least 100 times more responsive than the 12 nanometer sensor. So we can see the, uh, the thickness effect coming into play here where you're depositing the film around the deep length range and you can see the uh, signal amplification here. Uh, also one important thing is whenever, this, uh, whenever the signal is being amplified, uh, now you need not operate the sensor at a very high temperature. You can just operate the sensor at room temperature. So all these measurements were uh, from the sensor at room temperature itself. Uh, so now you can cut down on the power. And so the power which was consumed by these sensors was in the 200 microwatt to 500 microwatt range. Uh, and a majority of that power is also consumed by the UV LEDs, which were used to recover the sensor uh, to the baseline resistance values. Uh, and the UV LEDs were duty cycled in between 12%, uh, 6% to 10%. Uh, and trying to understand a bit more about uh, what is going on here. So we did the AFM and we saw that the surface is like extremely smooth when we deposit it with ALD in the picometer range, which is not the case uh, which is, uh, with the sensors outside uh, deposited by spray pyrolysis or uh, other CVD methods. We see a grain structure and the mechanism is often not attributed to uh, the grain structure uh, being depleted fully of electrons and then you see the resistance change. Resistance change. So it's not a major contributor to uh, to our film response here. What the major contributor is the effect of D by length, uh, the film being in thickness in that range. So uh, across all the different thicknesses, we see that the D by length is uh, actually increasing with the decrease in carrier concentration, decrease in thickness. The sudden drop in the carrier concentration could be attributed to the interface layer uh, that we see in the TEM image. It would have an influence uh, in modulating the oxygen vacancies and thereby you'd see a sudden drop in the carrier concentration in the lowest thickness film. Uh, a little more into the analysis, we did the XRD, and we see uh, the three graphs uh, at no anneal, 400C and 600C. After 400 uh, Celsius, we see a formation of 110 peak, uh, uh, which is an indicator of the rutile crystal phase. Uh, what, what is that, how is that important is because uh, that phase is where we have a high concentration of oxygen vacancies are also, they are very stable. So that is uh, that was found to be very ideal for gas sensing. Uh, cross sensitivity is an important parameter uh, which would uh, which can adversely affect the sensing response. Uh, so we have tested uh, our sensors for cross sensitivity with carbon monoxide and formaldehyde, which are the other pollutants that we find in the atmosphere. Uh, we found uh, zero to one percent, which is very less uh, when compared to the other sensing response with the ozone that we have seen. Humidity is another important factor uh, because uh, in the case that we have suggested, uh, in the test case, like in the environment, the humidity varies anywhere from 30 to upwards of 70%. I think right now, today in Delhi, it is around 50%, but when you go to the south of India, it's greater than 70%. So we need to characterize the sensors with the humidity as well. And this was our work in that direction uh, from 30% RH and 70% RH. We can see an amplification of the uh, sensor, sensor response. Uh, so humidity has a catalytic effect when it is uh, used in along with ozone. Uh, so even in presence of the humidity, we see, uh, of course, a very good signal to noise ratio. Uh, and also in this direction, we are trying to calibrate the sensor in the EPA labs, in the Envi Environment and Pro Protection Agency labs at uh, UNC. Uh, so the flow there is actually a diffusion gas flow rather than a directed gas flow, which is more like the real time sensing, like where the ambient uh, with the ambient conditions where the gas diffuses onto the sensor, but it's not directed onto the sensor. So uh, with varying humidity and temperature, we have seen uh, that the sensor is giving a good response even in that case. We have actually integrated our sensor with, uh, with, uh, with a wearable device, uh, and we were able to successfully integrate it, and we were testing in the EPA labs uh, with, the, uh, with that device. Uh, this is the benchmarking for ozone, and we see that it was uh, highly responsive and it had good selectivity when compared to the other sensors uh, in the same field. Uh, 
applications, we could use this technology and exploit it to actually uh, make ALD e nos so that we could uh, we could make uh, deposit ALD materials of other other ALD materials like copper oxide and zinc oxide, use this thickness effect and make an ENOS. Uh, so ENOS could be used for both breadth and environment monitoring. There are already some ENOSes out there in the market. You have the Cyranos 320, there is NASA JPL uh, ENOS, but they typically consume a lot of power in the 100 milliwatt range. Uh, and they are very bulky devices as well. So uh, that is not really efficient for real-time breadth and environment monitoring uh, in the long run. So uh, having a device, a smart ENOS watch, uh, it would, uh, if we make that with ALD sensors, then it will have very little power consumption as I've just shown. shown. So it is, uh, consumes power in the 200 to 500 microwatt range per sensor. Uh, and then it would be a single platform which would be ideal for breath and environment monitoring. In summary, we have fabricated uh, AL, ultra thin ALD sensors uh, capable of sensing the PPB range uh, with very low power consumption, very little cross sensitivity. Uh, the calibration of the sensors is on the way in the EPA labs, and we have successfully integrated our sensors with the wristwatch uh, and testing it in the real-time uh, simulated environment. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the NSF uh, for funding our assist program, and special thanks to all the people over here. Uh, thank you. I'll take any questions.